Okay. Uh, let me turn the, the this tape recorder also on. All right, this is the first session for Islamic studies RE405 and RE609, both undergraduate and graduate level study. Today is March 4th, 2019. We had some delay because of technical difficult difficulties with the screen. <laughs> but let's start with prayer. Father God, we thank you for today and commit this time and this class into your hand and look forward uh, to learning how to share your precious gospel with the Muslim people all around the world because we know you love them. Jesus died for them and wants to rescue them from the lies of Islam. Uh, ask your blessing upon all the students, both in class and online, and uh, guide and lead us in our studies, in our discussion, and may everything be done for your glory. For in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. All right, um, let's start first. Um, uh, as you look at your populi, um, and I put the syllabus, uh, everything there. Any question on the syllabus, any assignment, any anything? I have a special request for sure. you, Professor. Yeah. Is it possible uh, we move the due date for our paper from, uh, I think the due date is uh, April 8th to April 22nd, because we're gonna have a spring break after this week, then, then you can have the opportunity to use this free week uh -huh. to write a paper. Oh, sure. Let me, because let me just go there. Um, so, before you we start the week seven, okay. but at the end of, uh, not week six, but. So let's see, uh, currently we have that for, if this thing moves on uh, the due date, I think I put it on week six. Yeah. Yeah, which we have the, uh, the, term, the term, yeah, we put the term, the, the term paper due April 14th. You want to move that to what date? Uh, because we're gonna have um, a spring break. Okay. And uh, it gives you is on Sunday. Okay. Yeah. Uh -huh. well, next week, when, when we go more. Uh huh. Because you, 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 we want to have class. Is it possible? To move it to the following Sunday? Yes. Yeah, to 21st. Yeah, no problem. Okay. Yeah, yeah. that's no problem. I will. Make Thank you so much. Change. Now, if some people want to turn it in on 14, they're fine. But I, I will, I leave it on the 14, but I put a due date for the 21st. Okay. Yeah. Well, any, any question? Do you have any question, brother, from the syllabus, anything? Um, well, I haven't done my books yet. So okay. I'm oh, okay. Um, there may be a copy in the, I, I'm sure there's a copy at the library. If you couldn't find one, let me know. I think I have an extra copy of this book. No, not the other ones, but I can give you a, a copy of this book. All right, just let me know, uh, send me a, email or post a, uh, uh, put a post on the Populi um, so I can, uh, I, sh I should be in my office on Wednesday. So if by Wednesday you couldn't get your textbook, um, just let me know. You can come by my office. I am at the admin building, the church side, right on the church side, uh, room 317. So, yeah. Yeah, you know, when you enter yeah. and you see a building yeah. on your left-hand side, yeah. come third floor, uh, I can give you a copy. Um, I'm 
summary? How many pages of what? Uh, the the okay the syllabus. I think you are in six o nine. Is that right? You take it the graduate level. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the summaries um, in the syllabus, uh, both for syllabi, both for uh, graduate and undergraduate, I've mentioned the summaries are supposed to be, I believe, only three pages. Yeah. Um, yeah, the two page actually um, on those uh, books: "The Dark Side of Islam" by R.C. Sproul, "The Islamic Antichrist," and "The Muslim Mind." You just Two pages, Trubian style. Just look at them, uh, give a summary of the book, and just its a strength and weaknesses. That's all. Okay. If you look at your syllabus on page uh, six, oh, well, let me see. On, that's undergraduate. On the, well, I'm sorry, that was for undergraduate that I told you. The graduate, again, two pages, but there are five books. Yeah. Five. yeah. And uh, on page six of your syllabus, uh, uh, you can see the description. Uh, Trubian style, two page each on the following books, give a summary, strength, and weaknesses for each of them. One by R.C. Sproul, one Islamic Antichrist, one in Muslim Mind. One connecting with Muslims and another one Islam in the context. Okay. And if you're behind, don't worry, just uh, do your work, submit your assignment, I will accept it. And the first point is a small book. Yeah. It's easy to read. Okay. All right. Um, uh, professor. Yes. Uh, Relate to the visiting an uh, Islamic mosque. Mm -hmm. I had opportunity to visit in three or four. Oh. Uh, uh -huh. When I traveled to Turkey, oh. is it possible to relate to this experience? Wait, when did, when was that? Sorry. When was that? When? Ah, uh, uh, last July. Oh, last July. Okay. Last July. And. What's yeah. Yeah, okay, I accept it was, that. It was very I, interesting. I accept One of them is an important mosque in uh, Istanbul. Yeah. The Sullivan Mosque. Okay. And just me and my son, we can enter because <laughs> my wife and my daughter behind on the, 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 the department. Um, except there's, you know, if you could, you know, this is very good, you can relate them to the, to the, your, paper to your report okay. but if you could go and visit one locally as a part of the course here i would appreciate that okay. yeah and there are a number of them um, there's a big one in balboa avenue and they in fact they'd be very glad to have you uh, go there on a day other than saturday uh, friday because friday is their day of prayer so yeah, because of the course requirement there has to be that during this course time. So uh, if you could do that. It was five, six months ago. Yeah, but still, <laughs> it's outside of the course. Okay. So, but you can relate from your experience of going over there, um, what you saw and report that in your report um, um, or in your term paper. You can use that experience, okay? okay? Anyway, all right. Uh, if no more question, we can go uh, to our uh, uh, study. Let me just just do one thing here. You know what? Because you've done that, uh, how many mosques did you visit over there? How many? How many? Did you go to a number of them, you said? Yes, I think it's four. Okay, I accept them. Just, because just one, one is important most here. There's a Sullivan mm -hmm. down in Istanbul. Yeah. It's a beautiful uh -huh. and a huge. And then there's, there's, it was on Friday as well. Uh -huh. And they start to call 
Yeah, yeah. Leave just this. write that. Just write that. Just a report on that. Uh, and if you could include my, my, my son uh, was impressive because this <laughs> this is differently. This is strong. Yeah. And when they start to call, uh -huh. well, the mirror names. Uh -huh. Yeah, loud. <laughs> loud. What's happened? And I I start to explain to him. This is important for him to understand this. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Sure. Uh, but if you could also. Uh, mention your reflection from other mosques that okay. you were there. Okay. I would appreciate that. Sure. Yes. Are, are we all no, no. I I will share my testimony uh, briefly as a part of the first session. Uh, this is an introduction part. Why should we study Islam? Uh, well, there are more than one million Muslim uh, just in Asia. Uh, there are. The last, this is an, in fact an old uh, statistic that's from 2013. This is six years old. In America, we have almost three and a half million Muslims. Um, and we have the Great Commission of Matthew 28 go and make disciples of all nations, and that includes the Muslim also. I believe the Lord Jesus Christ loved the Muslim people. Uh, he hates Islam, but he loves the Muslim. And he wants the Muslim to come to the, uh, he's saving knowledge. Um, again here, uh, you have this on the populi, uh, you have a, this is a demographic of the spread of the Muslims around the world. He, um, large, I mean, 300, almost 320 million in Middle East. In Asia, almost 1 million. In Europe, 43 million. Uh, in sub-Saharan Africa, uh, 250 million. And in Latin America, you know, uh, 840,000. In America, three and a half million. So there's a large population of Muslims spreading all around the world. And that makes, I really believe God has brought them here for the opportunity that we must go out and share the gospel with them, reach out to them. I'm not saying that they all come to faith, but we must sow the seed. That's our responsibility. Um, as for what my testimony, I came from Iran. You can see that right there uh, from the city of Tehran, the capital city. I was born as a Muslim and grew up as a Muslim. I, and I was a practicing Muslim. Uh, I was doing my prayer, reading the Quran. I was trying to the best of what I could do, I was a teenager at that time, to be a good Muslim, to follow my religious duty. And I recall, in fact, when I was reading the Quran, I would come across many, many references. You find many references to Jesus and to Moses in the Quran. And that rose my curiosity. I wanted to know more about them. I wanted to read the gospel, or in Farsi, in Arabic, they call it Injil. Now, Injil comes from, it's a, a Arabic version, Arabic pronunciation of the word evangel, uh -huh. the good news. <laughs> and, um, you know, if you talk, you're talking to the Muslim, if you tell them New Testament, they have no idea what you're talking about. Uh, so I always, when I'm talking to a Muslim, I use the word holy angel, uh, holy gospel. And by that, of course, I don't mean only the four gospels. I refer to the, the whole New Testament. But, you know, they don't, unless they come to faith and they become uh, familiar with Christian vocabulary, you, t you, tell, you talk to them about New Testament, Old Testament, they have no idea what you're talking about. Uh, in their mind, you know, Jesus brought the gospel, uh, Moses brought the Torah, uh, David brought the Psalms, or they call it Zabur, and that's it, and maybe some other prophets. Um, so terminology is very important. Uh, I grew up as a Muslim, and I, as, I, as I said, as I was reading the Quran, coming to many references to Jesus and Moses, that rose my curiosity. I wanted to read their books. Now, the common, the general teaching of the Islam, 
uh, of all Muslims, Shiite, Sunnis, is that uh, the Bible is, has been corrupted, is unreliable. The Christians and Jews have changed their scriptures. Even though in the Quran, as we shall see right here in our lesson, there are references to the validity of the Bible. But you see, let me tell you something from right now. Don't expect consistency from Islam. In fact, this is true from uh, about all world religions, the false world religions, uh, which I'm not including Christianity. All the world religions have internal contradictions because you cannot uh, systematize error. Error has always a contradiction in itself. Uh, it's only Christianity that uh, can be systematized. It's only in Christianity that you can find systematic theology. There is no Islamic systematic theology or uh, Buddhist systematic theology. Anyway, um, even though they say the Bible is corrupted, but there are references in the Quran to the validity of the Bible. And so I, I remember I didn't know where to find a copy of Bible in Iran. And this was before Islamic Revolution. Um, I asked some of my teachers, especially I had a religious teacher uh, in Iran. We had to take um, uh, religious courses. And um, uh, one of my uh, my religious teacher all through high school was a son-in-law of the late Ayatollah Khomeini, the founder of Islamic Republic. And he was a good man. And I asked him about where can I find the Bible? And he warned me. He said, no, no, you should don't try to read the Bible. It's been changed, it's been corrupted. But even as a Muslim, I couldn't accept that argument. Because for me, you know, uh, remember, I'm not, I wasn't a Christian. I, had, I didn't know anything about Christian apologetics, the defense of the Bible. But that argument didn't make sense to me. Because I, I argued for myself that if there is a God, if we believe in Allah, and we believe that he's all powerful, the least he can do is to protect his own world. If he cannot protect his own world, what kind of God is he? So I couldn't accept that argument. So, but I didn't know where to find the Bible either. Uh, till one day, my father came home with a copy of Bible in Persian, Farsi Bible. Uh, when that happened, I thought that was only a coincidence. I asked my dad, well, why did you uh, get a copy of Bible? Uh, my father uh, was a journalist and also worked in the uh, Iranian uh, national radio and television before the revolution. Um, so I grew up in a home with many, many books. Uh, so he just was curious. He wanted to read the Bible. Um, but later on, I, now that I look back, I could see how God was working both in his life and in my life because my father came to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ before he died. Uh, so when he got that copy of Bible, I took it for myself when I started reading it. Uh, the problem was, it was an old translation of the Bible into Persian, something like King James Version. And I was only a teenager, and it was very hard for me to read it. I had difficulty to understand, considering, you know, for a person that had no background in Islam, yeah, I mean, in, in, this, in Christianity, uh, that was confusing. But I got attracted to the book of Psalms. And even though I had difficulty in reading the God, New Testament, the life of Christ was very attractive to me. The person of Jesus, his love, his humility, his compassion. Um, I remember I loved the book of Psalms so much that I wanted to incorporate, I wanted to say these prayers for myself because it was quite unknown for me. You know, in Islam, when you pray, you don't pray like the way we do, you know, openly talking to the Heavenly Father, sharing what's in your heart. It's a set of creed. You just repeat that set of creed seven times uh, toward Mecca. 
So, uh, but the, the, you know, the liberty that I could see in prayer of David and other people in the Psalms just really attracted me. So I went and asked again the same religious teacher, the son in law of late Ayatollah Khomeini, uh, is there a place in our prayer, Islamic prayer, that I can say what, what's in my heart to God, to Allah? And he just said, you know, such and such a place. But in reality, there is no <laughs> place in the Islamic prayer. You just repeat that, and when you finish, maybe you can say what's in your heart. But he said that, I think, to just get rid of me. <laughs> and, uh, and what I would do is, when I would come to that section, I'd just open the Bible to the book of Psalms, and I would read the Psalms to God. <laughs> uh, later on, I find it really amazing thinking that in an Islamic prayer, I'm reading a Jewish prayer. <laughs> I find it quite uh, interesting. Um, that went on. Uh, I was attracted to the person of Christ, but again, I couldn't um, understand uh, lots of things. Uh, I couldn't understand the divinity of Jesus. I couldn't understand Trinity, um, the sonship of Jesus. Till I left Iran uh, and I came to the United States uh, in 1979, 40 years ago. Uh, when I was a student in a college, one of my teachers happened to be a very kind of excellent Christian, good Christian, committed believer. And God was working in his life. In fact, he is one of the person that you are supposed to read his book, Dr. Ed Hoskins, the man who wrote the book, a Muslim mind. He's the man who led me to the Lord. Uh, he was my teacher in college, and he's a doctor, medical doctor, and also he had a PhD in physiology. He was my biology teacher. So I was taking this course. I first class I'm taking at the college, and he's teaching this class, and the Lord has put in his heart desire to reach out to the Muslim people. Later on, he went with the Christian organization for a mission to meet a Muslim in Middle East. He went to Lebanon. Um, and he was delighted to have me in his class. We became a very good friend. He would invite me to his home, uh, especially I remember Sunday nights. Um, you know, I was an international student, and Sunday night uh, cafeteria was closed. So it, I, would, I was glad to go to a home uh, and eat some homemade food, and uh, they would show me hospitality, and he spent lots of time with me, and gradually started asking me whether I, liked, I would like to uh, study the life of Jesus from the uh, scriptures, and I agreed, and we started reading about Christ, and it took me a year till it was Christmas of uh, 1981, Christmas Eve, that I prayed and gave my life to the Lord Jesus Christ. After that, I finished, when I finished my college, uh, went for graduate school, then eventually I felt the call of the Lord for ministry. I went to Trinity Evangelical Divinity School in Chicago, got my Master of Divinity degree from there. Then uh, uh, I felt the Lord and the church also confirmed that to come here to Southern California to reach out to Iranian people in this area uh, and do church planting. So I came here and in, uh, by God's grace in 1991, we um, started the Iranian Christian Church of San Diego. And uh, about 10 years ago, with the support of Shadow Mountain, we started another small church here in El Cajon. And I'm involved with the also TV and radio ministry that broadcasts gospels in Farsi to Iran, to Afghanistan, and through satellite around the world. And I can tell you that uh, many, many Muslims have come to know the Lord Jesus Christ inside Iran. And God is doing a great work, both in Iran, in Afghanistan, and in other parts of the world. But especially in Iran and Afghanistan, I can say that, and I really believe that God used the Islamic regime in these two countries 
to draw people towards himself. So that's about me. <laughs> um, uh, I read your introduction on popular, I, of course I knew you. Uh, you can also, there are some of the things you can uh, post on popularly, like introducing yourself, uh, participating in the discussion. Could you tell us a little bit about yourself, brother? Yeah, I'm sorry. I've just no problem. Been, been no problem. Um, <clears throat> I'm a pastor Can you work in San Diego doing gang bang and everything? Like, say, in February, February, So, um, great. You said you're a pastor of a church. Mm -hmm. uh, what kind of church is that? Oh, great. Great, fantastic, fantastic. Well, it's great to have you. Great to have you here. Okay, let's go. Um, there is this video I like us to watch, but let's do this at the end, if it's okay. I want to first uh, do as much as we can, uh, go to our uh, studies, and because if uh, if, if, we, if we don't have enough time, you can watch that on Populi. Uh, let me show you where uh, there is on, on Populi. Let me do Let's do the stock share. Okay. And go here. Okay. If you go to lesson one, Okay, if you go, I put the old, the last time I taught this class, the video recording of that right here. It says video recording of session one. This is from uh, August, July and August of 2018. So if you go there and click on session one, then uh, YouTube will come and you can, uh, if you want, you can watch that but if you go here let me show a bot uh, you got about 37 minutes inside forward into the that session then you can see that video but if you have time we will do it uh in the class also. All right. Sure. I know. All of the moon, right? So the moon god, you mean? Yeah. Oh, okay. We will get to that. There is that theory. Okay. I, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Finish your question. I was just wondering, like, because you know, uh, I'm so I was just wondering, like, I mean, I don't know. You guys don't, as Muslims, you don't know that text. Most Muslims don't know anything about that, about the kind of the concept of the moon god and the um, the roots of uh, Allah. The, the deity worshipped in Islam. Um, now, I personally think, you know, the word Allah is also used in Arabic language as a generic term for God. Um, it is used in the Arabic Bible for God. Um, but, you know, I personally think that uh, it refers to God in general. But what I want to make it clear that the Allah of the Quran is not the same as the Allah of the Arabic Bible. God of Quran and God of Bible are not the same, completely different. Now, regarding the roots of Allah, the theory that 
many people have that that was a moon god and the worship of the moon god uh, was common in the, that part of the world. There is that theory, but I think there is, you know, that may have an effect, but I think there is, there is something else going on. Um, I, and again, may, many people don't know that. Many people are not familiar with that. If you ask most Muslim why there is a crescent at the top of every mosque, they will not be able to give you a clear answer. They may claim that that's because of Muhammad's miracle that he divided the moon. But even that's not a clear answer uh, that, well, yeah, I mean, if you, if you divide the moon, you don't get a crescent. <laughs> yeah. uh, where, where does that crescent moon come from? But I think the roots of it is something else, and that's from the Gnostic teaching. Uh, you see, if you, again, uh, let me make sure that this is there. If you go to lesson one, uh, I made a video myself, Islam and Gnosticism and watch that about 30 minutes. Uh, you will find, uh, I don't know how much you're familiar with Gnostic teaching, but in Gnosticism basically is the idea that there is one uh, deity that is absolutely one. Uh, they, in fact, they call it monad. And uh, it's one absolute oneness of this deity. And then from this deity, you have emanation. And as you come like a ladder to uh, lower steps, the concentration of deity uh, uh, becomes less lower and lower till you come to the physical world. So basically, there is a dualistic view of the world. Um, anything physical is evil, anything is spiritual is good. And then that teaching has affected Islam. Uh, there is a gospel, is a Gnostic gospel, false gospel. It's called Gospel of Thomas. Um, it's from dated from the second century AD. Uh, the oldest manuscript comes from Egypt. No, interesting. Thing, uh, no, remember two things. Remember, there are two Gospel of Thomas. One, what, they're both false. They're both Gnostics. Uh, one is called the Nativity Gospel of Thomas. Then one, another one is a compilation of supposedly sayings of Jesus. In the Nativity one, you find a stories about Jesus that you find directly in the Quran. Like when Jesus was a teenager in Egypt, uh, well, he went to Egypt with his family. He would make a a uh, dove out of clay, he would breathe in it, and that dove would become alive. Well, well <laughs> in fact, I use that as a proof of his deity. I say only God can do that. <laughs> a mere man cannot do that. But that's a Gnostic story that's in the Gospel of Thomas and also in the Quran. The, the other Gospel of Thomas, it has 114 sayings of Jesus. Uh, can you tell me, does that number 114 ring something familiar to your mind? Your mind? I'm, I don't expect that to know because you got to know the Quran. Quran is compiled of 114 verses, <laughs> yeah, surahs. So, um, and again, you find that uh, connection between Gnosticism and Islam. Gnostic, because if you look at the word, that everything physical is evil. Then you, when you come to Jesus, and this has, uh, Gnosticism is a source of many heresies. When you come to Jesus, you only have two options. You either have to deny his humanity, or you have to deny his deity. And that has happened. Or uh, you, and about denying his deity, you can deny his, his deity completely, or you deny his deity to some degree. For example, in the fourth century AD, in Alexandria, there was a man who used to be a bishop of the church over there, then he got kicked out because of his heretical teaching, named Arius. And he's the guy who started the Arian uh, controversy, Arian heresy, that says Jesus is a, is a, semi-God, but he's not the real God. W what does that remind you today? 
Jehovah Witnesses, exactly. That's, they are the descendant of Aryan heresy, even though they don't know it, but it's the same lie. You see, and Gnosticism spread in that video, I express how Gnostic teaching went from uh, Rome and Greek to Persia, and then from Persia to Ar Arabian Peninsula, and then from there to North Africa. Uh, because of that, no, basically what Arius was teaching was a Gnostic view of Christianity. Um, so he made Jesus less than the real God, the true God. You come, you move again forward, you come into 5th century, the Armenian Orthodox Church denied the, uh, the humanity of Christ. They fall into a heresy called monophysite, that Jesus only had one nature. He only, uh, they, they believe in his deity. They fully believe that he's God, but they say he only appeared to be human. The Eastern Church fell into that heresy. Again, that's an influence of Gnosticism. Because if you look at it, that everything physical is evil, everything is spiritual is good, then you have to either deny Jesus' humanity or his deity. And you go through history, you find this all this heretical teaching. You come to 7th century, to Islam, to Muhammad, he denied Jesus' deity completely. Uh, because says, oh, how can God become man? No, this is uh, blasphemy, uh, on and on and on. But you see Gnostic influences all over Islam. Because, for example, uh, both the Shiite and the Sunni, they have influences of Gnosticism. Uh, you know, like in today, in Syria, uh, all the fight that was going on in Syria with Bashar Assad, you know, he's Alawite. That's a branch of Shiism. And they almost adore Ali, Muhammad's son-in-law, to the point of almost worship. Now, how can this happen? How can a religion that is so emphasizes monotheism, says only um, you know, emphasizes so heavily on the oneness of God and worship of Allah, how can you almost ascribe in deity to Ali? And in the Shiite religion, especially the 12th Imam of the Shiite religion, these Imam, they all have some uh, essence of deity. How can this happen? Gnosticism, Gnostic influence. So uh, I, you know, I gave you a long answer to your question. Um, for two things, unfortunately, most Muslims, they don't know the history and the roots of their religion. Number two, I think it's, yes, um, the worship of moon god was common around that area and most probably influenced Islam in many ways. But I think even that worship of the moon god, moon god was a part of the overall Gnostic heresy. <laughs> anyway, did I answer you? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, um, um, the crescent moon was a symbol of the moon god. That the idols, the remains in archaeological evidences, <coughs> it's because uh, the crescent moon were, uh, is, was a symbol of that idol that used to be worshipped in the Middle Eastern area at that time. Anyway, let's continue. <coughs> uh, Islam in brief. What is Islam? We want to talk about that. Who are the Muslim? We want to mention about six articles of belief, five pillars of Islam, the prophet of Islam, the Quran, and then points of conflicts and points of reaching the Muslim. What is Islam? Islam is an Arabic word meaning submission or surrender. It's a religion embraced by nearly a fourth of the world population. And maybe again, that statistic might be old, uh, maybe it's changing. Uh, so 
uh, that's something to consider. Um, who are the Muslims? Uh, as you can see, the picture I have here, that's Mecca. I've been there. When I was 14 years old, I went there and did the pilgrimage. That's the, this cubic shaped building that you see here is called Kaaba, which basically means cubic, cube in Arabic. And people pilgrims around it. And these customs were in existence before Muhammad because that place was full of idols. And that's why you don't find any descriptions of how to do Muslim pilgrimage in, uh, in the Quran because people knew it. All these things came from the time of idolatry. And there are some people who in fact called Islam idolatry under the veil of monotheism. <laughs> you know, the people pray bowing down toward uh, Mecca toward Kaaba, they claim it was built by Abraham. They call it the house of God or house of Allah. And this is a flag of Saudi Arabia, which is written on it. There is no God, but Allah and Muhammad is his apostle. And there is a sword. Uh, a person who follows the religion of Islam is called a Muslim. And a person becomes a Muslim by knowingly reciting what is called Shahada or witness. And shahada is, you say, when they say, based on faith, that there is no God but Allah, and Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. There are six articles of iman, or belief. Uh, Allah, got to believe in Allah, the holy books, the holy prophets, angels, the last day, the day of judgment, and destiny. Um, then there are five pillars of Islam. Uh, these, are, ha, these have to do with daily practice. Uh, shahada, you know, witness that you become a Muslim. Then praying uh, five times a day toward Mecca. Uh, they call it Salat or in Farsi Namaz. Um, zakat, charity, giving of 2.5% of your income to mosque or to charitable groups, uh, to poor people. Fasting one month of the year, Ramadan, from dawn to the sunset, which was, again, history tells us, going back to the concept of moon god, uh, that this was part of the religion of that idol, that deity, that they would commit the one month of the year to fasting, and it starts it's seeing the moon, the crescent moon, till the next one. Okay? And you have pilgrimage, hajj. Uh, once in your lifetime, you are supposed to go to Mecca, if you can, if it is possible for you. Regarding Muhammad, the prophet of Islam, he was born in 570 AD in Mecca, Arabia. His name means highly praised. That's the name of Muhammad. When he was 25 years old, he entered the service of Khadija, married her that year, and she was 15 years old, older than me. If you have any question, any time, please uh, stop me and ask your question. Oh, he, uh, she was a businesswoman, and she had uh, many caravans, uh, trading, uh, importing, exporting. Uh, Muhammad entered her service by uh, taking care of these caravans. So um, he would go to different places. And in fact, because of that exposure, he was exposed to many ideas, teachings, Gnostic teaching. That's why in the Quran, somebody studied the Quran and were able to find traces of um, mythology, stories that goes back some to India, some goes to Greek, uh, Rome, Persia, from all over the world. <laughs> um, the city of Mecca is considered the holiest place in Islamic religion. Um, you have, this is a city again, this is that cubic shaped building and the big mosque around it. Yeah, 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 that, this is the, that one on the corner. On the corner of this building, uh, one of the corner you have this, which is basically a 
a meteorite, a black stone meteorite. And they come and kiss it. And they say, it's fallen from heaven. I, I say jokingly, you've got to be very concerned about things that are fallen from heaven. <laughs> um, uh, full of idols. And there were, at the time of Muhammad, there were many Jews in Mecca and Medina. Medina is another city. Uh, Yatrab used to be called before Islam, 280 miles from Mecca. Uh, there were Christians, mostly Nestorians and mostly, unfortunately, Gnostic Christians. And that was one of the causes of Muhammad's confusion. I I, I'm not trying to take away his personal responsibility, but he was exposed to a wrong version of Christianity. Uh, in fact, the night that he claimed he received revelation from God, that he claimed an angel appeared to him, he was frightened when he, he was in a cave. When he went back home, he was frightened. And he tells to his wife that, am I demon-possessed? <laughs> See, it's interesting. There are Islamic books that, re, that narrate this incident, and they say he was scared. And Khadija took him to his cousin, uh, a man, Barakat ibn Nofel, and he, this man was a priest in, uh, in, in a Gnostic Christianity. There are many evidences that point to the fact that Khadija was a Christian, but a Gnostic Christian, because his cousin. And that man, that cousin, Nofel, told to Muhammad, no, 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 you are not a demon possessed. You are a prophet for these people. You see, if you follow the Gnostic belief, emanations come from that monad deity, well, you're just an emanation for your people. So, in fact, it's this guy that put the idea that you're a prophet of God into the mind of Muhammad. Muslim claim that Muhammad was illiterate. That's not true. There are many evidences that he was literate. He signed treaties, peace treaties, as he was uh, making wars with different tribes, uh, Meccan forces. He studied under the Jewish rabbis in Mecca, and he studied with these, unfortunately, heretical Christians. So he was not illiterate. Can, do you know why, why Muslim claim that he was illiterate? Okay. Um, the Quran was divided by a text and the here. Yeah. That's their claim, that they say um, he was illiterate, and that's a proof of uh, the divine origin of the Quran and prophethood of Muhammad, because how can an illiterate man say such a wonderful things? But that claim doesn't hold. In fact, in our textbook, Dr. Geisler uh, goes through that and discuss that claims of the Muslim. Uh, because uh, if you look at the Quran, uh, as far as Arabic grammar, there are errors in it. As far as, you know, if you're talking about <coughs> being such a highly, uh, high written, uh, you know, literature, it's, it is not. There are far better books in Arabic language than the Quran. In fact, there are, it's very difficult to read. It's disjointed. It jumps from one place to another. Uh, it's hard to follow. And even, even if that was the case, what does it prove? Nothing. Because, because something is high quality literature, well, uh, we don't say William Shakespeare was inspired by God, even though he wrote some wonderful books. Uh, so that, that doesn't prove anything. But in any way, he was not illiterate. He was literate. Um, in the year 610 AD, he claimed to receive revelation from God through the angel Gabriel. Um, and it happened in a, uh, in a cave of Mount Hera near Mecca. This is that uh, mount and this is that cave uh, that uh, we can see. He, now here is another thing about the, uh, the, uh, uh, the arrangement of the Quran. 
the first surah, surah 96, uh, the first surah, the first revelation that Muhammad received is not surah number one, it's surah number 96. The way that the Quran is arranged is not by chronology, not even by topic, but by the size of the revelation. <laughs> so they call, you know, because it's a short revelation, apparently they put the longer one in the beginning and the shorter one at the end, that he was called to be the prophet of uh, Allah. But as I said, that night he went home and he was scared because he thought he's demon possessed. Um, after his death, he died in the year 632. His saying were compiled as the Quran. Now the word Quran or Quran uh, means recitation. Um, it's a sacred uh, scripture of the Muslim. As I said, it's divided into 114 sections or surah. Same number of that Gnostic gospel. And it claims Allah has the only true God. Um, it's not written by Muhammad. It's just compilation of his saying. Uh, recitation, divide 114. Oh, I guess this is repeat. Uh, and you can divide, it, it can be divided into two periods. These are important to know. Meccan periods and Medinan periods. Uh, the Meccan periods, the surah over there, you find it more kind of a spiritual in a way that Muhammad acts as a moral teacher, as an advisor. When he was forced to leave Mecca, he goes to that city of Yathra and then changes the name of that city to Medina. Now, the Medina in Arabic means city. And basically means city of prophet. He became, he, at, when he made that migration, that which is, becomes the beginning of Islamic calendar, he became a ruler, a dictator, actually. So you find the verses, the Medinan verses, very harsh. You know, he, he acts like an uh, autocrat as a dictator. Uh, now, in order to reach out to the Muslim with the love and truth of Christ, we need to know our differences. Uh, first of all, and again, this goes back to uh, Gnosticism, the root problem is absolute transcendence of Allah, which is the same in Gnostic. In the Gnostic belief, that monad deity is absolutely transcendent and all these lesser emanations down all the way down to us we are all trying to reach out to that monad but nobody can and even if we could we only become absorbed in his being we lose our identity follow me okay now keep that in mind the, the importance of the doctrines of transcendence of Allah. In Islam, Allah is totally separated from the creation. It is a form of hyper-transcendence. Therefore, because of that, there, there are certain consequences. Okay, let's look at that. Islam denies the concept of sinfulness of man. Man is not born with a original sin. Adam and Eve only made a mistake and then they uh, corrected their mistake and their sin is not uh, transmitted to human nature. Um, Islam denies the separation between God and man is a moral separation. Okay, can you tell me how this point number two relates to the absolute transcendence of Allah. Because um, if, if the fact is okay, okay, you are on the right track. So 
The flesh is evil. Physical things are evil. The spiritual thing is good. Yeah, and therefore, the separation between God and man is not a moral separation. That goes back to point number one, because the, yeah, the psalm denies the original sin. But it says, yes, there is a separation. But that separation is natural. It's the way it's supposed to be. Because we creatures, we physical creatures, we are not supposed to have a, a close relationship with Allah. You know, we are, we have this sinful physical form and physical and spiritual don't match. Uh, the separation between God and man is normal, ontological, because of the, the way God in Islam is and man in Islam is. And it denies the concept of original sin. That's, you know, that's one thing. In Islam, you see, let me ask you this question. Uh, do we, when a child is born, is it, I mean, when God says to Adam and Eve, go and, you know, populate the world, you know, what is it? Is it every time is the act of creation or procreation? Procreation. You know, of course, a child, if you say, is a creature of God, created by God, and you accept that, you are creating God's image. But it's not the case that every time a child is born, there is a special independent act of creation. It's procreation. Because of that, from the time of Adam and Eve, when they fell into sin, their whole being, uh, that original sin is transmitted to us. Now, in Islam, in every time a child is born is a direct act of creation because they want to deny the concept of sinfulness of man. Why do they want to deny that? Because they want to maintain that separation between God and man. Because we say, say okay, go ahead. Allah. Or you can do some. It's not a sin. Yes. Yeah. Or you can do some, uh, you know, some pay some kind of uh, retribution for your whatever you did and it's taken care of. You can buy your sins. <laughs> and, and, because God and man are supposed to be separated. We are not, we are never supposed to become, God is never supposed to become our father and we are not supposed to become his children. Therefore, this separation must be kept. Therefore, every act, every time a child is born uh, is a special act of creation. Oh, the non-Muslims, you mean? Yeah, yeah it's the same thing. Muslim or non-Muslim. We are not born with the original sin. Okay. So, um, Abraham, 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 Abraham. Yeah, again, they, they are um, condemned until, unless they come to faith in Allah. But their condemnation is not because of original sin. It's because they have not embraced Islam. Uh, so in, in the Islam, uh, the separation between God and man, because God is transcendent. That is the point. Yeah. Okay. It's, and it's natural. Okay. And uh, we say it's no. It's not the cause of the sin. Exactly. We say in the Bible, we say no, this is not natural. This is wrong. This is immoral because of man uh, sinfulness that separation happens. This is the view that we don't need redemption and salvation. Oh, okay. That's <laughs> when we got to the other point. Therefore, there is no need for atonement. <laughs> if you believe the separation between God and man is normal, then you don't need an atonement. You don't need a cross. Islam denies the cross. Islam denies that Jesus was crucified on the cross. 
They say somebody else was crucified. Most likely they say Judas. Islam denies the deity of Jesus because again, going back to the root of Gnosticism, to say Jesus was God is blasphemy because you're mixing spiritual deity with sinful flesh. <laughs> but by the way, physical body of Jesus was without sin. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 5 tells us about that. And Islam denies the Holy Trinity because it comes right face to face uh, uh, in contradiction with the absolute oneness of Allah. Again, Gnostic influence. The picture that you see here is a dome of rock uh, in Jerusalem uh, or Masjid al-Aqsa. They claim Muhammad ascended from there to heaven. They, uh, <laughs> yeah, that's a, it's a, is Miraj. Uh, we will get to the verse, but, but it is in the Quran that he ascended to heaven and then uh, uh, from, a, from a rock in, uh, in Jerusalem. Not, they, 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 the name Jerusalem is not used, uh, but they say in a night he flew from, you know, where he was in his home to Quds. They called it Quds, and then from there to, uh, to heaven, to uh, presence of Allah. Okay? All right? Islam denies that the Bible is the word of God. Islam denies that salvation is through faith alone. Believes that Muhammad is the last prophet of God and believes that the only uh, word of God is the Quran. These are the ten points of conflict. Now let's look at more. Where's the root of uh, Islam denies uh, the Bible as the true word of God? What? Very What's the root? Okay. Historically, if you look at the scripture, there are verses. I mean, if you look at the Quran, there are verses that says the that, that uh, Allah supposedly says that the 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 Christian and Jews change my word. But then. I will show you uh, in, at the end of this PowerPoint. There are this verse in Surah Yunus, Surah 83, that um, uh, in fact, Allah says to Muhammad, if you have question, ask the people of the book, because the truth has been given to you, given to them before you. Yeah. Now, the, the root of it comes from here. You see, as I said, don't expect consistency from the Quran. You find all these contradictory verses or surahs. Whenever Muhammad had good relationship with Jews or Christians, you find favorable verses. Whenever he comes into conflict with them, you find that they, Christian and Jews fell out of favor. Basically, as they saw that the scripture, Old and New Testament, doesn't accept the Quran, it comes into comes into clash with the teaching of the uh, uh, Quran. This accusation of the, uh, the the corruption of the scripture start growing. I say, oh, because they change the scripture. You know, it's a it's a ridiculous way of uh, argument that you say because what you say contradict my belief therefore what you say must be corrupted must be changed <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah i'm sorry i said the only people who have corrupted the bible are the people that change it. So, yeah, yeah 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 <laughs> yeah 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 and you know the challenge is where where does it where where is it corrupted where do you find the corruption in the bible uh, there is an answer for all so-called contradiction and errors. Unfortunately, in our modern times, when you come as after 16th, 17th century with the rise of liberalism in Europe and then to some degree here in America, now the Muslim uh, missionaries, they, uh, they try, they use the arguments of liberal so-called, I don't call them Christian, but liberal uh, 
Westerners against the Bible to um, uh, strengthen their arguments against the Bible, that the Bible is corrupted. But those arguments have been proven to be without any content. Uh, <clears throat> like they still hold, uh, a couple of years ago, I attended <clears throat> a symposium that a uh, number of Muslim scholars from Saudi Arabia were at San Diego State, and they invited us, me and some other prof from the seminary, to go to that symposium. And they, they still hold to a, a bankrupt theories like JEDP theory. I don't know if you're familiar with that. That's an old, old theory against the Old Testament uh, that they say JEDP, you know, the different names of God, Jehovah, Elohim, other. They uh, means that there were many different writers of the first five books. Moses didn't write the first five books. And there were different, almost religions, uh, one following Jehovah, one following Elohim, one following another one. Uh, and Wellhausen was a German liberal, uh, supposedly uh, Bible scholar, who first uh, uh, came with this theory. Uh, and they still hold to those, but those theories many years ago were analyzed and proven to be without basis. <laughs> but the Muslims use that. Okay. Anyway, um, let's see. Right, let's go for another 10 minutes, then we'll take a break. Um, the concept of Allah in Islam. Allah, again, these are direct influence of Gnosticism. Allah is unknown and unknowable. In fact, Allah cannot know himself because self-knowledge means differentiation, and which you cannot have uh, in, uh, um, uh, uh, in Islamic theology. God is not personal nor spiritual. God is not active in history. He does not come down or enter into history. He is not holy or righteous in the sense of looting or separating himself from sin. This is something very important. We believe our God is holy. That means there are things that he cannot do. True? There are things that our God, the true God, cannot do. He cannot sin. He cannot lie. It is not the question that he can do sin, but he doesn't do it. No, that's not what we are saying. We are saying that he just unable to commit sin or lie or anything like that. And I praise such a God. I worship such a God because I can trust him. I can rely on him. But in Islam, Allah, he can do whatever. He can even do something contradictory to his own decrees. There is no boundary for him. And in fact, when you tell that to the Muslim, no, you know, through God, there are things he cannot do. They get surprised. Can you see the connection between that view of God and some of our modern day problem in Islamic wars? You see, if you have a God who is not uh, bounded by any kind of covenant, any kind of rules, any kind of agreement, he can do whatever he wants to do. He can say something today to you, one thing, and tomorrow. In fact, it is in the Quran. It says he can lead, he leads some people to right path and he misleads some people to the wrong path. He does that. I mean, that's Oh, that's horrible. <laughs> yeah, How, can you see some connection between that and you know the fact our God put Himself under His own holy standard, not Allah, not Allah of Islam. Can you see a connection between that and some of the problem that you see today with the Muslim world? Yeah, they can come to you 
and even among themselves you can <laughs> you can find like what's going on in afghanistan they try to get this taliban uh, to come to some kind of peace agreement with the government of afghanistan okay you can gather everybody under a roof in a big nice room and they all sit and drink tea or coffee and talk and they hug and they smile sign a paper next monday we'll start killing each other it doesn't matter because at that time i may because of some benefit for myself i can lie i can sign some treaty then i can break it you know in fact there is a term for that in islamic religion it's called taqiyya yeah you know lie for the cause of islam you can lie yeah, yeah. Khomeini, <laughs> he said oh it is not only not wrong to lie for the cause of islam it is in fact commendable you have to do it unbelievable but once you understand you know there is this principle you become like the god that you worship if you worship a god who lies who can break rules you will become like him if you worship a god who is holy who hates unrighteousness you grow in holiness anyway in islam god has no feelings or affection for any creature because again feeling and affections are uh, not considered worthy of god he's not supposed to be binding himself by a covenant and definitely he's not trying in nature okay let me see what time it is. okay yeah. just a couple of more minutes uh, well let, yeah yeah let's go a few more minutes then we take a break how to reach out to the muslim again i wanted to first this first powerpoint is a kind of a introduction and overview of you know some of the main points of islam conflicts that there exist between islam and christianity but how we can reach out to the muslim number one pray fast rely upon the holy spirit it's not our powerful argument but it's the power of prayer power of the word of god power of the holy spirit that infiltrate the hearts and minds of the muslim people they can come to faith they can be converted. I have baptized number of Muslims right here at Shadow Mountain or on, on our campus in San Diego. They can come to faith. That's a lie of Satan that creates fear in us that the, no, the Muslims are just beyond salvation. That's not true. Nobody. Nobody is beyond salvation. Uh, number two, confront them with the law of God. Because you see, the Muslim problem is very similar to the Pharisees. There's a sense of self-righteousness. That's, they have that problem. I find a study of Sermon on the Mountain, very good place to start with the Muslim. Because it shatters that self-righteous attitude. You know, they think they're good people because they don't commit murder. Okay. But the, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Jesus says, if you hate someone in your heart, if you gossip, if you badmouth someone, committed murder. They say, oh, we are very good people. We, we don't commit adultery. Jesus says, you look at a woman lustfully. You have already committed adultery. That, it shatters that sense of self-righteousness. Very similar to the Pharisees. And another thing is, you got to show them from the scripture the holiness of God. You know, they don't, under, because their God is not the true God. <laughs> I believe the God of Islam is a, de a demonic being. Uh, he is not the true God. Uh, he is not a holy God. So, you got to show it from the scripture, the holiness of God. You know, they think, okay, what's the sin? Okay, God can forgive. No, why? I tell them, Nahum chapter 1 verse 3, he doesn't forgive. He punishes sin. And the fact that we are forgiven, the fact that we are saved from the wrath of God because that punishment came upon somebody else. 
upon his son. But it's just not, it is not the case that he's, okay, I let, I let it go. No, no, no. no. <laughs> he doesn't. His holiness demands justice must be done. Show them the seriousness of sin. Then tell them about the love of God. You see, you are putting your finger on a sensitive issue because of the Gnostic back. If you tell Muslim about the Gnostic background of Islam or, or about the Munga, they have no idea what you're talking about. But this is something good for you to know as you interact for the Muslim to know how to reach out to, to them. Tell them about the love of God because that bridges that separation. You're bridging that transcendence. Tell them how God, how the love of God is given to us through Jesus. You know, that verse, uh, uh, John 3, 16 is wonderful. Simple verse, wonderful. And share with them why God can just forgive sin without proper penalty for sin. Because that's the way they're thinking, okay, oh, why not? Why doesn't God just forgive us? I mean, he, he can forgive us. Well, <laughs> somebody has to pay for the penalty for, for one of his laws, his decrees is broken. Justice must be uh, taken care of. And I think that they will have problems with a term such as son of God. They, when, usually when we talk about Jesus as a son of God, they consider it blasphemy. They consider it we are saying God had sexual intercourse with Mary or they they don't understand that term in you know generally. I find the best explanation is Hebrews 1 3. The sun is the radiance of God's glory and exact representation of his being. That's the definition of Son of God by the scripture. Just share it with them. That's what we mean by the sonship of Jesus. Explain Trinity to the best that we can. Uh, we believe in one God, but in three distinct persons. Not three gods, but one, three persons in, in one God. And, uh, and at the end, Deuteronomy 29, 29, the secret things of God belongs to him. No one can claim that fully understand Trinity. But we can grow in our understanding and in our knowledge. And again, explain to them why Jesus is the only way to God. You know, uh, I remember one time talking to a Christian lady, and she was saying that maybe I shouldn't have, she, she had witnessed to a Muslim woman in a hospital uh, and told her that Jesus is the only way to God, and that Muslim woman was offended. And she was saying that, she, did I do something wrong? I said, no, 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 no. <laughs> you did right. But explain it to them. Why do we say Jesus is the only way to God? It's not out of pride. It's not that we think we are better than you or we are higher than Because he's the only one who paid the penalty for our sin. And what he paid was acceptable before God. That's why he's the... Uh, only way to God, because he was sinless. <laughs> um, okay, let me see. Now let's take 10 minutes break. Uh, it's about time. <laughs> well, let me stop this. Are you familiar with um, Sammy Tanaka? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he used. Okay, yeah, according. Uh, let's go to here. Now, why did we go wait? All right. There we talked about that. Now, you can also, uh, when you are witnessing to a Muslim, explain to them the authenticity of the Bible. Um, you know, we have based on manuscript evidence, the Bible has not been changed. And then there is an argument, I will show you at the end, that, you know, uh, from the Quran, I don't usually recommend using the Quran for um, witnessing to the Muslim because 
you're giving credibility to the Quran. I don't want to do that. Uh, but sometimes I make references, just maybe small references to break the wall um, and start and show them the, uh, get them to start reading the Bible. And I will show you an argument at the end. Avoid attacking the person of Muhammad. Now I know, I believe he was demon possessed man. He was a false prophet, uh, all that. But you don't gain anything by attacking the person of Muhammad. Focus on Christ. Focus on the love of Jesus, the truth of Jesus. As people are exposed to the light, the, the darkness will go away. And they will start under, by themselves. They will start thinking and understanding how Muhammad was wrong. Uh, avoid, as, as, I, as I said, avoid using the Quran to prove the Bible because that gives credibility to Quran. Exception is that Surah 1094 that we'll get to it. And regarding your question that you asked about where does in the Quran refers that Muhammad went to heaven, it's Surah number 70. I know it says much heaven, but it doesn't mention Jerusalem. Oh, okay. It's a, it's a common belief. You see, you have, we have two sources in Islam. One is the Quran. One is the Hadith or the tradition. It's from the Hadith that says that he went to uh, Quds or Jerusalem, and from there, from the rock, he went to heaven, and that's become the site of the, uh, the, the, doom, uh, the dome of rock or Masjid al-Aqsa. Okay, about the hadith, uh, it's an interesting uh, discussion. You see, <clears throat> as you will read in your textbook, um, as Islam started to spread, then they find out in different parts of the Islamic empire, people have different versions of the Quran and different versions of you know, the stories in the Quran and the things in the Quran. And that was, that was at the time of uh, Ottoman or Osman, the third caliph. But is it a problem of translation? Or is it no, no, problem? it was the same language, it's Arabic. Arabic. In Arabic, they had different version, not translation. Now, I'm not talking about like somebody in Persia or in other parts of, no, right there in Arabian Peninsula, they had different versions of Quran. And, and, and they criticized the authenticity of the Quran. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> now, what Osman did, he commanded all those different versions to be gathered and be destroyed. And he made one version, his version, to be the standard version of Quran. The Quran that we have today is Osman or Othman uh, version uh, that exists. But you know better than me, books don't get destroyed. You know, you may try to gather and burn the books and all that. They go underground. They show up in other places. Or people have memorized stories uh, verbally and they become oral traditions. And later on, they will be put in writing in some other form. I personally believe that the roots and the source of uh, the hadith are those, many of it goes back to those version of Quran that are being destroyed. And it shows up in different in tradition, in stories. That's my view. <laughs> but uh, it's, it's an interesting study, the roots of Islam. But basically, there are two major sources in uh, Islam. One is the Quran, and one is the Hadith, the teaching, uh, the tradition. Does it exist in the originals of Muhammad? Does it what? The, uh, the originals. No scripts? No? Oh, no. We, uh, as far as the, you know, textual study of the Quran is very poor in comparison to because Bible. I remember that uh, many years ago, I was in the Perelman Museum in Berlin, and I saw the originals, parts of the originals of the Quran. 
of the Quran. Yes. Yeah. But but and temporary exposition. But even even those, it it doesn't really go to the seventh century. We don't have those texts. It, it's much later. You know. In fact, you know, the, the our textbook uh, later on we will come to it. Uh, one of the in chapters talks about, you know, makes a comparison between the, okay, page 239, uh, the, it doesn't talk about the Quran, but it gives a comparison of the, for example, manuscript of New Testament to other historical books. Uh, it's just amazing the accuracy as far as the date written, the earliest copies, time gaps you know the Quran as you put that through this kind of study well doesn't come close to the Bible uh, there is no uh, manuscript of the Quran that dates from 7th century you have copies or you have translations of years further back because remember at the time of Osman, the third caliph, he destroyed a number of them. <laughs> and he, he made things easy for himself. So let's just, you know, we in, the, in, in Christian faith, uh, we uh, face these different uh, readings and we, we, we bring scientific answers that, look, if these supposed differences are not really any kind of... Uh, contradiction or error in the text but but the muslim they did what they did was their solution was they'll just burn them <laughs> let's get rid of them so there's only one version this is it uh, but when that is that's very uh, uh, to closing your eyes to the truth and i think about when I'm working about the muslim avoid crossing the gender line Men with men, women with women, don't cross that because it creates confusion and problem. Explain the re reliability of the Bible based on ancient manuscript. Encourage them to study the life of Jesus from one of the gospel. Now, I think we can give all kinds of arguments and defense and all that. I myself, when I was exposed to the person of Jesus, you know, just the Spirit of God takes the word of God and works in the person's life and pray for them. Now, about Surah 1094, I don't know, do you know about this Surah? Are you familiar with it? No. Okay, this is a very good way to respond to Muslim claims that when they say the Bible is corrupted. Ask them, when was it corrupted? Was it before the seventh century or after the seventh century? Now, the reason I put that 7th century because that's a date that Islam appeared in the world. You see, if they say it was uh, uh, corrupted before the 7th century, then you have this verse in the, bio, in the, in the Quran, Surah Yunus uh, or Surah 1094, that Allah commands Muhammad. He tells him, if you have any spiritual question, ask the people of the book. Christians and Jews, because the truth was given to them before you. Here is the uh, al haq truth. The tru the, it refers to the scriptures of Christians and Jews as truth, their truth. So it couldn't happen before the seventh century. If that was the case, God, our Allah, should have said to his prophet, No, 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 have nothing to do with them. These guys have changed my word. Uh, no, there's a question, how could men uh, change God's word? You know, so you're saying men are more powerful than God? <laughs> Beside that, but it, it, it couldn't have happened before the seventh century because then it contradicts this verse. If they say it happened after the seventh century, well, by if you, even if you take the most liberal position, even the people who deny the integrity of the Bible, they all would say, the most liberal position would say, we have the Bible as we have it today by the fourth century. Mm -hmm. I believe we can go much further back 
but let's take the most liberal position, not conservative position. You have it by the fourth century. So it couldn't happen before seventh century, so it could, and it couldn't happen after the seventh century. The answer is it didn't happen. <laughs> the whole argument is wrong. It didn't happen. Um, okay, and you have that in your popular. Okay, let's again stop this here. Okay, actually, any questions so far? Good, actually. Now let me go to some of our chapters. I think it's better if you could watch that video at home because we, I don't want to hold you all night. <laughs> Stop okay. uh, and then go to another page here. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, Let's again, uh, we let's go into Dr. Geisel's book, chapter one, about Islamic monotheism, mm -hmm. the Islamic view of God, basic Islamic assumption, the, the word about Allah, the etymology, the roots of the word Allah. Oops, sorry. Uh, Muslim claim Allah is the same as God of Bible. The Arabic Bible uses the word Allah, but they are completely different. Now, I don't have a problem with the word itself. You know, I don't have a problem to use the word Allah uh, to refer to God as we are talking to the Muslim. But you got to make it clear that the Allah of the Bible is not the same as Allah of the Quran. Part of the problem that we are facing comes from the Christian missionaries in 19th century. When they were translating the Bible into modern Arabic, unfortunately, they choose the word Allah. Now, again, I agree, Allah is a generic word for God in Arabic, but we can, there are other words, al rab for example, there are other words that could have been used uh, for God. But again, we are stuck with it. So I don't have a problem with the, using the word Allah provide that we understand and we communicate that the content of Allah of the Quran and the Allah of Bible are very, very different. But the difference is because of the, 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 the Quran's, Quran's God is transcendent. That is the main difference. Well, there are lots of other. That's the main the doctrine. Main, the main. But there are many other things. Okay, of course. Many other things. I mean, he just, he's not triune, he no, is, triune. Uh, he, yes, <laughs> he's not bounded by any kind of moral laws, okay. he can do whatever he wants to do. So I say, frankly, I mean, I don't go say to a Muslim, but I say it frankly that the Allah of Quran is an evil spirit. Yeah, he yeah, says that in the Quran. He deceives people. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. Oh, good. They are one of the first few students I met that read the Quran. <laughs> good. Now, etymology of the word Allah. It's a compound Arabic word. Al-ilah. Al is the definite article in Arabic. Lah was a name, means basically uh, deity. Maybe the name of the moon god, quite possible. That's possible. And the sign of the moon god in different Islamic symbols, you can find it on uh, flags of many Islamic countries. You find the crescent. On the top of every mosque, you find a crescent. And they don't have an explanation. Where, where does it, well, we have the cross because our Lord died on the cross. Uh, the Jews have the Star of David because uh, that was the shape of the shield of David in his battles. But what, why moon? <laughs> where does that come from? So anyway, 
Uh, now, there is another theory. It says, Allahu uh, means to worship. And Al-Ilahu was a supreme object of worship, basically a generic name for God. Anyway, I, uh, I can accept that, but I can also see there's a possibility that was a name of the moon god. Uh, but let's not get, you know, uh, bogging into the uh, roots of it because we want the problem, even if it was a generic name for God, Allah of Quran is not the Allah of the Bible. God of Quran is not the God of the Bible. Before Islam, the name of the it was a name of the chief god in that Kaaba. The Allah was the name of the chief god in that whole uh, set of deities, the idols that the Arab tribes had. Three hundred sixty idols uh, that pagan Arabs used to have. Uh, the importance is the concept, not the term itself. Now, again, we talked about that he is absolutely other. Uh, transcendent, he's uniquely one, Tawheed. The greatest sin in Islam is shirk or assigning partner to God, such as, in their view, Trinity, such as saying Jesus is the Son of God. And God relates to the world only by his word, emanation. He doesn't come into it. Again, that Gnostic teaching, Gnostic belief. No, 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 no. If he comes to the world, he will defile himself. And he's absolutely free. Let me read you this page from page 31. Uh, okay, page 31. There's that, in a, almost to the bottom of the page, there's that uh, quotation uh, from Hadith. It says, uh, I, I will read it to you. It may be that one of you will be performing the work of the people of paradise. So that between him and the paradise, there is a distance of only an arm's length. You know, you're doing good things. You're a good person. You're a good Muslim. And, you know, you're almost going to enter to the paradise. But then what is written, what is decreed for him overtakes him. Or what is decreed by Allah. And he begins to perform the works of the people of hell into which he will go. My God, this is horrible. I mean, just think of it. This is terrible. I mean, I may be doing good things, and then suddenly the decree of Allah comes upon me and overtakes me, and I start doing evil things, and I go to hell because of that? I mean, <laughs> come on, what, is, what kind of justice is this? <laughs> it's amazing. Allah comes over you. Basically, like yeah. I mean, what kind of God is that? That's evil. You change your mind. Yeah. That's horrible. And that's why you find, you know, again. In working among the Muslim or even the ones that who come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, I see that quite often in my Christians who come from Muslim background. You know, one of the major problems they face is insecurity, in counseling. Because if you have such a God, man, think of it, in, in, you know, in families, uh, if you have an abusive father, the kids will have problems, psychological problems, emotional problems. By God's grace, we can overcome those things, but the pains, the scars are there. And many of these people, even after they come to faith, yes, the Spirit of God works in them. Yes, the Spirit of God heals them. But it will take a while because they come from that background. They are always, you know, you, you feel you're walking on an eggshell. You know, you don't know. I mean, if you, if, the God that you're faced is such a horrible monster. You're always shaking. You don't know what can happen. <laughs> you don't know peace. I myself, this is my testimony, and I, this is a testimony of many Muslims who have come to faith. The peace of Christ that passes understanding, 
the love of God that is unchangeable. These are the things that draw people, draw Muslim to faith. When they experience that peace. When I've talked to Muslim on the phone, when you know they said we go back and forth, back and forth argument, and they say about that thing, and I say, you know what? God loves you. And they start crying. Jesus, he gave his son for you. That breaks all those arguments. <laughs> it's wonderful. Um, now, we talked about the importance of the transcendence of Allah in Islam. Allah is totally separated from creation. It's a form of hyper-transcendence. As consequences, uh, the separation between Allah and man is normal. The separation is not immoral. It is not because of man's sin, but because of nature of Allah. Therefore, no atonement necessary. There is no need for the cross. And the portion of the Bible that talks about God's involvement in human history or simple, uh, yeah, simple epistles cannot be accepted as a word of God. One of the major problems that Muslims have with the Bible, one of the things, you know, going back to your question, that why they say the Bible is corrupted, they look at our Bible, they see epistle letters, and they say, how can a letter be a word of God? Because in their view, God doesn't come into this world. They have problem with the books like Book of Acts, or in Old Testament historical books, how can God enters human history? How can a historical narrative be the word of God? Because the concept of inspiration for them is just like a faucet. When you go to a, you know you you go to a wash your face, you open the water and the water shrunk. That is their view of inspiration, which is, to be frank with you a view of demonic possession. I believe he was, Muhammad was demon possessed and he would be possessed by a demon and then he would say some things mm -hmm. and you know, demonic possession, uh, not that I encourage you to <laughs> get involved with things like that, to, but usually people who are under demonic influence, they say things or they may write things and later on they may have no idea what they say or what they wrote because they were under the influence of a demon. That's their view of forever. Or putting it in a kind of more polite way, dictation theory. The man itself is nothing. Uh, you just like a typewriter, like a secretary, you just type. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. An incarnation cannot be accepted in a uh, Islamic view of God. We talked about the points of conflict. Again, some of God is unknown and unknowable. Influence of nominalism or Gnosticism, basically better than that. He's not personal. He's not spiritual. He's not active in history. He doesn't come down or enter history. He's not righteous as hating sin. No feeling we talked about. This is not trying nature. Let's look at some other relevant issue. Muslim tends to uh, <clears throat> look at religious languages uh, in a material sense uh, because, again, um, that emanation from in Gnosticism, they look at religious uh, terminology in a material sense, literal anthropomorphism. Anthropomorphism basically means uh, similar to humanity, but we use anthropomorphism. Uh, they say the wind like blows. No, there is not a mouth that blowing the wind, but we use that as terminology to describe something. But they take that literally. Their view of fate corresponds to their view of God. If you have a God that has decreed everything that then and you just and doesn't enter into human history doesn't uh, have a you don't have an encounter with him therefore their view of faith is that you only accept certain principle you accept certain creed 
and you only make a verbal confession of those three. Do I make sense? Are you guys following me? So you see, in a, for a Muslim, you know, for us, our God is our heavenly Father. We commune with Him. We pray with Him. We have that communion relationship with Him. Uh, he He had entered into human history. Uh, he's alive. Um, but in Islam, he only sent his decree, his war through his prophet. Therefore, faith is you only accept his creeds. That's all. And, and then there is a consequence to that. There's not so much, there's not much practice. It's only acceptance mentally. <laughs> it's a problem. They will have a problem with the book of James. They say, you know, okay, you believe in certain things, great. Demons believe in those things too. Where is your, you know, where is the fruit of your belief? <laughs> you following me? Okay, good. Uh, what happens if you have this kind of view of God? It cuts you from a personal relationship with God. It cuts you from a know, knowing God personally. It cuts you from rationality. If you have a God who can change his mind every moment, like I just read you, you don't have a point of reference that you can rely. And you become extremely insecure. It cuts you from morality. If my God can lie, can my God can sin, why not me? I can do that too. You know, they talk about the 99 names of Allah, but again, these terms cannot be used as they are used in human languages. Here it is. They say, oh, but uh, Allah is, uh, there are these names. First of all, they're not names, they're adjectives. Secondly, it says, like, he's merciful, compassionate, da-da-da-da-da-da. But if you sit and talk with them, so, but no, 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 no. You cannot use, nominalism basically means this. You cannot use the word, for example, mercy, as we use among ourselves, humans. You cannot apply that to God. The meaning of the term mercy for God is something different. What is it? Could you tell me? No, I can't tell you. That's only the secret of, of God. But then this is nonsense. This doesn't mean anything. <laughs> And again, I would say they have 99 names, but they miss the hundredth one, the most important one, the Father. They, can, they don't call God their heavenly Father. And why in the, in the Quran there are 99 names? They are, they are, not, they are just compilation of this adjective of Allah from the Quran and the Hadith. Okay? But, uh, you know, they are not, these are different. When we talk, when we refer to name, we say, for example, Jehovah or Yahweh or, the, you know, f the Father. You know, these are names uh, we use for God. But uh, these are mainly adjectives that they have. But they, even those adjectives, when you try to discuss them, you say, okay, if he's compassionate, okay, uh, so a compassionate person, I think of a compassionate person, a caring person. You say, no, 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 no. You can use human uh, examples to understand compassion, uh, compa compassion of Allah. <laughs> so well, then what, <laughs> what's the point of having uh, 99 names? Uh, give me a thousand names. <laughs> what's the point of that? Um, as I said, they believe Bible is corrupted. The doctrine of corruption or tahrif. They say the previous scriptures are the word of God, but when they contacted the Jews and Christian communities, they saw that the scriptures of the Jews and Christians don't match with the Quran. So what's the solution? Deny the, Quran, deny the uh, scripture of Jews and Christians. Yeah, no, 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 no. They, they used to call Trinity as God, Jesus, and Mary. The modern Islamic leader re recognized that it refers to the Trinity as the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. But in the past, they used to say Trinity is God, Jesus, and Mary. 
They consider Jesus only as a prophet and they definitely deny his deity or sonship. Their view of Christ is a merely human prophet. He announced God's message, performed many miracles by God's permission, saved by God from being crucified. Again, what's the root of this thing? What's the root of rejection? It goes back to transcendence. There is no need for the cross. Why should we have a cross? Why should anybody die for our sin? The separation is normal. And uh, then again, the implication for Christian believers is, uh, one of them I just told you is, uh, they think faith because they come from that background. Even if they, when they come to faith, you got to work with them. They think faith is just because in the Quran was when you say the Shahada and you just mentally accept some creeds, you're fine, you're a Muslim. They think that, okay, if I mentally accept some doctrines about Christianity, then I'm fine. Well, doctrines are important. I'm not saying they are not important. What well, doctrine must come with practice. If, if it's just or in my head, no. Read Book of James. <laughs> Uh, or they have problem with insecurity. They believe that Jesus didn't die on the cross, transported the life to heaven. He will arrive, he will return at the end time with Mahdi. And both the Shiite and the Muslim have Mahdi. Both of them do. Uh, it's just that the difference between the Shiite and the Muslim about Mahdi is that the Shiite, they say, he's the 12th Imam from the line of Ali. The Sunnis say, he's just a Muslim that we don't know who he is. But they both have this, uh, their savior, so-called. Exactly. Well, I would say, you know, okay, I will get to that. <laughs> That's a good point, but uh, I... I wouldn't, I wouldn't go that far because of boundaries of hermeneutics. But I can say this with definite, with, uh, indefinitely. When you read Revelation chapter 13, it talks about the first beast, the Antichrist. Then there is another beast, the false prophet. And when you read the description in the middle of chapter 13 of book of Revelation, it says, he came from earth and he looked like the lamb but talked like the dragon. He's a false Christ. Now, in Islam, we have this tradition that Christ will return with Mahdi and will embrace Islam and he will tell Muslim people to embrace Islam and follow the Mahdi. Whoever this guy is, he's a false Christ, which corresponds to Revelation 13. You see, the reason I, say, I use hesitation about calling the Mahdi the Antichrist is this. If you want to do that, you have to go to a source outside the Bible. In other words, you're going to Quran, you're going to Islamic tradition to give interpretation to the scripture. We can't do that. that uh, even though I, do, I agree, I don't deny, there are striking similarities. But because of that, I hesitate to go and say that the Antichrist is the Mahdi, even though there are many similarities. But I can say this without any hesitation, that the second beast, the false prophet, the scripture makes it clear. He's a false Christ. He performs many miracles, and by his miracles, he deceives people. And he's like a, like an assistant to the Antichrist. Like a, he gives a spiritual reliability to the government of Antichrist. It fits this picture perfect. <laughs> but anyway. Um, they have problems with the prayer of Jesus. They say, if you say Jesus is God, why is he praying? They don't understand the concept of prayer. Prayer is not just give me, give me, give me. 
prayer is communion with God. When Jesus was praying, he was having communion with his heavenly father. <laughs> Doesn't mean, because, but this, you see, the concept of prayer in Islamic mind is just, I come with a list of my, uh, my grocery list and I say, oh, okay, I want this, 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 give it to me. Uh, unfortunately, some Christians pray like that. But uh, the, when, but Jesus, when he was praying, uh, uh, he was having communion with his father. They have a problem with the limited knowledge of Jesus about his return. I said, well, he limited himself voluntarily. Uh, Philippians 2 tell us he set aside some of his privileges to human form. He didn't lose anything about his deity, but he set aside some of his uh, prerogatives. That's all. Um, again, <laughs> again, this goes back to the concept of transcendence and you know, um, and we respond to that saying, that, no, our God uh, coming to this world and he's active into this world. Uh, he can take the human form without damaging his deed. Um, let me tell you, I mentioned that in the fifth century, the Armenian Orthodox Church and mainly the Eastern Church fell into a heresy called monophysite. Now, the Pharisee of monophysite, mono means one, Physite or phys, physis, uh, physis means nature. Okay, so they basically means Jesus having one nature. Okay, and they believe in Jesus having only the divine nature, not human nature. That was again influence of Gnosticism because you cannot mix spiritual and physical together. There is this book, Armenian Christology and Evangelization of Islam, by an Armenian theologian. Excellent book. I have it. I will bring it next week for you guys to see. He shows in that book, in fact, that heresy, that false view of Christ, was one of the reasons that the Eastern Church, I'm not saying the only reason, but one of the reasons that the Eastern Church could not respond to advancement of Islam. Why? Let me tell you. Let's say the Islam is advancing, the Muslim army is advancing, and then you also have Muslim uh, missionaries. They will come to some Christian community and say, okay, look, your so-called Lord or your so-called Savior is God. And you also say that. You believe that he only appeared to be human. He wasn't really human being. It looks like that he, appeared, he was human, but he was God. You cannot relate to that. But our prophet, Muhammad, was a man just like us. He had many wives. He had fight with his wife, argument. He would have all these kind of uh, temptation and all these troubles and all that. You can relate to him. So, you see, that, when, when you mess with Christology, when you mess with a person of Jesus, either his deity or his humanity, you end up having serious consequences. And one of that, it was this, that Islam looked more appealing to common people. Yeah, because they could relate to Muhammad. But you can, you can, how can you relate to a ghost? If Jesus only appeared to be a man, he's like a ghost. I cannot relate to him. <laughs> So that's why you know, correct doctrine is so important. They deny the sonship of Christ. These verses work salvation, no need for atonement. Uh, then uh, you can ask this, how would you explain titles of Christ in the Quran? Messiah, the word of God, the spirit of God. These are from Quran. And again, the root problem that they have is, goes back to nominalism. They say, oh, well, uh, it, when we talked about, about the spirit of God, and because I, this is one of my arguments. I say, Quran Surah 4, verse 171, refers to Jesus as spirit of God. If he is a spirit of God, my spirit, your spirit is 
one with you. If he is a spirit of God, he must be God. But they say, oh, no, 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 no. You cannot use this terminology that we use among ourselves for God. Nominalism or Gnosticism. You see that? Mm -hmm. uh, okay, let me... I promise you, it won't take you too long. Again, problem, influence of Gnosticism. Uh, please watch that video. But um, one interesting thing is like... Uh, Wanted to show you the inconsistency in Islam. You see, in Surah 85, it says, Quran is the eternal speech of God and existed in the mind of God from all eternity. Okay, so we have the Quran. We say it's the eternal speech of God, therefore, it's eternal, therefore, it has divine attribute. You follow me? It is uncreated perfectly expresses the mind of God, but it's not identical with the essence of God. In, in other words, you have God and you have the Quran. You follow me? So you have polarity within the unity of God. You, do you follow what I'm trying to say? Okay. You have God, Allah, then you say the Quran is eternal, uncreated, uh, expresses perfectly the mind of God, but it's not identical with Allah. So you have another element with eternality, uh, uncreated. Um, yeah, but okay. They say what they wrote it down was reflection of what is in heaven. Think of that ladder in Gnosticism. Watch that video that I have. Okay. Okay. The word is the common point to attack, the, for instance, the epistles of Paul. Okay. This is letters. Okay. But you see, the point is this: they say there is a, the original version of Quran in heaven. That is the real one. Okay. Now, what we have as the Quran right now is a manifestation of that. Okay. But my point is something here is different. That Think of that original, perfect, uncreated version of Quran in heaven. My point is this that then you are end having a polarity yeah. in the nature of God. Then don't uh, criticize us why we believe in Trinity. Oh, you guys have... Oh, uh, uh, yeah? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. You know, like what I have done here with my Bible, I put these duct tapes because it's falling apart. The Muslims say, oh, they come appalled. My God, how can you do that? Or when they see, you know, when they, they say, <laughs> um, uh, if they look at my the Bible and they see all this handwriting, uh, underline, oh, wow, you can't do that. And yeah, I can. <laughs> so this is a paper and ink. <laughs> uh, uh, there's nothing uh, divine about that. <laughs> yeah, the, what is written, the, you know, it, I, I understand it refers to a divine word of God, but this is just ink and paper. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't worship it, but you're right. They almost worship the Quran. It goes right here. It goes back right here to this point. But my point is this, that their monotheism is not really monotheism. <laughs> it's polytheism. But I use that. Hmm? Yeah, yeah. And I use that. I said, yeah, you're right, because they have the law of blasphemy. If you say anything, uh, supposedly insult Muhammad, you have committed the law of blasphemy. But then I stopped and wait a minute. Blasphemy by its definition means you insult God. Muhammad is not God. <laughs> <laughs> so that cannot be even I'm not encouraging anybody to do that but I'm saying that, um, 
insult to Muhammad cannot be called blasphemy because he's not God, unless you really think he is. <laughs> then don't claim that we are monotheistic. You are not. First of all, Muslims are not monotheistic. They are Unitarian. They be, we are monotheistic. We believe in one true God in three persons. They are Unitarian. They believe in, in absolute one so-called deity that even cannot know himself. But even in that, such an emphasis that they put on monotheism, you have a problem. You ascribe some divine character to the Quran that you have two gods almost. So then I say, uh, you know, it's funny because here's, here's the point. I say in, the, in Christian faith, the word became flesh. In Islam, the word became a book. <laughs> About Gnosticism, I call it the mother of all heresies coming from Genesis 3, 5. When Satan said to Adam and Eve, if you eat from this tree, you shall be like God, knowing good and evil. Uh, please watch that video, but briefly, um, the word Gnosticism comes from the Greek word gnosis, meaning knowledge. Um, it's a belief in a remote, supreme, absolute one God, the monad, one unit. No differentiation in this divine monad is beyond human thought. Human thought cannot reach it. It's beyond comprehension. These are all description of God in Islam. He said, you cannot understand God. You, you know, it's as if you're reading a Gnostic book. The divine monad is beyond the material, even rational world. He can do whatever he wants, even irrational acts. There are continuous emanation from him, aeons. Uh, that's why, remember, we talked about that. In Islam, they believe in continuous creation. In the Bible, God created Adam and Eve, and they procreate. In Islam, every child is a new creation. Therefore, there is no transmission of the original sin. That's right. And then you, you can see the problem. Romans chapter 6, you know, when Paul talks about Adam and Christ, you know, the solidarity between us and Adam and then also with Christ. But if you break that chain, that whole argument falls. It's like a ladder. As you get closer to the top, there is more concentration of divine being. Jesus is one of these in that, you know, in that ladder. One of the rung in, rung in that ladder. Uh, as you come to the lower rungs, there is a lower amount of divine element until you reach the physical world, the most unclean emanation. Um, there is an element of divine essence in these emanation. Uh, that's why, for example, you know, Gnosticism, you have in the book of Colossians, the problem with angel worship. Uh, that's why in Islam, you have worship of Ali, worship of the, in a Shiite Islam, you have those worship of those 12 Imams. They don't call it worship, but the way they treat it, I don't know what, what name, other name you can call it, except worship. It's adoration. Uh, anyway, you can read these things for yourself. You know, the Demiraj, one of those lower emanation, created the physical world, and divine element fell into the material realm, locked in that material realm. And this divine element once, oops, return to the divine realm with no sense. Basically, Gnosticism is salvation through knowledge instead of salvation based on faith. You know, everybody desire to reach to the divine monad. Christ is only one of these emanations. <laughs> um, and he's the lower than the divine monad, heresy of Arianism, the third century and Jehovah's Witnesses today. It's a dualistic view of word. Uh, we had, you know, so-called false prophet like Mani, 
the Persian prophet Mazdak. You can, you know, I don't want to take too much time here. You can watch that uh, video. But the point, the point, the point uh, I wanted to refer again. Uh, if you fell into this thinking that God cannot take physical word, then either you have to deny the humanity of Christ or his divinity. This error, Armenian Orthodoxy, Eastern Nestorian Church, heresy of monophysite, Christ only appeared to be, uh, Christ has only uh, appeared to be human, he only has one nature, and this is heresy of Islam. Um, let me, this maybe summarizes, make it easier. You see, in the second century, we have the Gospel of Thomas, the two Gospel of Thomas. Uh, okay, you come to the third century, uh, for, I mean, actually, fourth century, the heresy of Arianism. Then you come to the fifth century, uh, you have the heresy of monophysites. You come to the seventh century, you know, in this one, uh, Arius denied the full deity of Jesus. In this one, they denied the humanity of Jesus. In this one, in 7th century, they completely denied the deity of Christ and the modern day Jehovah's Witnesses, which are similar to Arians. Am I clear? Are you guys clear? <laughs> or are you confused? <laughs> no, no, okay. Uh, anthropomorphism, okay. No, I don't want to take time for these. Let me just, because we are almost running out of time. Yeah, let me, let me just briefly mention about. You know, okay, let me just put, let me see whether. Okay. I tell you what, it's 6.35, and well, maybe, let's go 10 more minutes. I think I can finish. Okay. Uh, the Islamic view of creation and man, everything is created uh, to worship Allah and serve him in veneration. Uh, adoration, service of Allah is a true sense of the word. And that's a meaning of creation and human history. Uh, now, it is true in the scripture we say man is created to worship God, but also we have fellowship with him. We enjoy his presence. We have a personal relationship, father and son, father and children relationship with, with him. Um, the, uh, this is the reason of creation, to man to enjoy God and give glory to him in the Bible. Allah created angel. Holy Spirit is an angel. In fact, in Islam, Holy Spirit is angel Gabriel. Uh, it's not a third person of Trinity. Allah also created jinn. From the word jinn, we get genies in English. Some of them are good, some of them are bad. There are some halfway between men and angel. But as far as biblical point of view, they are demons. <laughs> Frankly. Uh, Allah created Satan or Iblis, and he was not an angel, but a jinn, the leader of jinn who disobeyed Allah. Uh, there are demons uh, from which you get the word genie in English. Uh, now, this is important. The nature of Satan rebellion, according to the Quran, and it's interesting, if you go and study some of the other religions in the Middle East, uh, uh, you remember a few years ago, was it two years ago or three years ago, uh, during the summertime when ISIS were killing many people in Iraq, there was a group of people called Yazidis. Remember that? Uh, they were killing them because 
again, I have to make this uh, clear. Even though I reject their belief, I don't agree with genocide. It is true, what ISIS was saying in one way, it was true that these guys, the Yazidis, who are the Kurdish, some of the Kurds, some of the Kurds, not all of them, in Iraq, they worship Satan. They do that. But they, they don't look at Satan the way that we look at Satan. They think that he was, some of them are similar, that he was an angel, but he was treated unfairly. <laughs> So, but both, both in the writings of the Yazids and in the Quran, the nature of Satan's rebellion and fall was this, that God created man, Adam, from dust of the ground and commanded Satan, who was a fiery angel, to bow down and bow down before Adam. And Satan refused to do that. And because of his refusal, he got kicked out of heaven. And he fell. Um, now the Yazidis look at it a little bit different. They said, Satan said, no, I'm not going to do that. That up to this point is also in the Quran. I'm made of fire. He's made of the dust of the ground. Why should I bow down before him? And then uh, in the Yazidis version is this, that the God of heaven says, well, actually what I asked you to do was a trick question. Uh, you're right. Uh, you answer good your question. Your, your response is very good. So I will give you the, the reign of this war to you. <laughs> so that's why they worship Satan. They, they don't look at it as he rebelled against God and he fell before God. But going back to the Quran, he said, no, I'm not going to do that because I'm made of fire and he's made of dust of the ground. Why should I do that? And because of his disobedience, he was kicked out of presence of God. Now, when I, I remember as a Muslim, when I first read this, heard about this, you know what I felt? I felt kind of sympathy for Satan. I said, you know, well, he's right. He's a victim. He's right. He's saying, I'm of a higher quality. Why should I bow down to a lower quality? Till later, I found out, well, yeah, that argument is true. When you consider the origin of this story, it's not from God. It's from Satan. <laughs> you, are you following? So my point is this. That narrative is satanic. That's not the story of fall of Satan. You read Isaiah 14, you read Ezekiel 28, you have the fall of Satan in the scripture. He wanted to become God. He wanted to take the place of God. That's why he got kicked out of heaven. Uh, <laughs> that, that tells you something. Uh, Allah created humans. They are his wise region or khalifa. Human nature, created innocent and free. Every person is a direct cre creation. You have perpetual creation like Gnosticism. We are sinless, no original sin. And um, Adam and Eve made a mistake. They repented. They were forgiven. And because every, every child is a special creation, is a creation is continuous, there is, uh, the original sin doesn't transmit. There is no need for a savior. Separation between God and man is normal. And the purpose of creation is he or she is a slave of God, habit. No, I mean, we are true. Okay, I understand. Paul calls himself, I'm a slave of Christ. But he's, he does that out of love, voluntarily. In Christ, we become. Uh, the, uh, we become the children of God. You know, if you go back to page 50, you see here it is. Um, and I believe this is a problem with uh, human history, with, uh, I'm sorry, with the Muslim society. Um, 
The best use of life, therefore, is not to live, to live it according to the teaching of God. And, and uh, I'm sorry, the best use of life, therefore, is to live, live it according to the teaching of God and to make it safe passage to the future. Can you tell me what's the problem with this way of thinking? And that's a root problem with Islamic society. It's basically look at life as something that all you, can, all you have to do, just make sure that you make it safely through this world to paradise. This life, this world doesn't work anything. We have in the beginning of the Bible, in the book of Genesis, the, that commandment of God, be fruitful and multiply. Dominate the world. Build it, cultivate it. Uh, and I say when it says be fruitful and multiply, he's not just referring twice to have kids, have children. They do that. He's saying, I believe when he says be fruitful, mean bring fruits of culture. Uh, build up the society. Build this world. Uh, I have created that. But if you look at this physical world as evil, Therefore, no, just let it pass. Why should you try to improve your society or improve your uh, social condition? I'm sorry? Destroy it. Yeah, destroy it. Or just let it go. Just, uh, you know, kind of doesn't matter. Just let it be destroyed. Don't do anything. Now, that's a problem. You know, think of it. Muslim societies, Muslim countries, in, the, in one of the richest countries, they have all, exactly, they have all these natural resources, oil, all, everything. But look where they are in comparison to many countries that do not have these resources. <laughs> um, oh, let me see. No, that, that'd be too much. To go for okay, let's stop here. Let me just remember where I am. So we come to the Holy Spirit. All right. So, but please read uh, the PowerPoint for yourself because there are questions on the quiz. Or read the study guide. If you read the study guide, you'll be fine. And if you couldn't find a textbook by Wednesday, give me a call or send me a email. I have a copy. I can give it to you. Let's have a prayer before we go. Father God, we thank you again for tonight, for the class. May everything that we learn be used for your glory in reaching out to the Muslim people with the truth and the love of Christ. We pray all these things in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. All right.